A combined effort between ILS, International Launch Services, Khrunichev State Research and Produ Production Space Center, Eutelsat and Airbus, you're now seeing live the ILS Proton launch vehicle with the Eutelsat 9B satellite on board. Eutelsat 9B will launch from Pad 39 at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan and is the 410th Proton launch overall, the 92nd ILS Proton launch, the first ILS Proton launch of 2016, the 11th Eutelsat launch, and the 21st Airbus launch aboard Proton. Liftoff is scheduled for January 29th at 5.20 p.m. here in Washington, D.C., January 29th at 11.20 p.m. in Paris, and January 30th at 4.20 a.m. in Baikonur. Stay with us as we count down to the launch of Eutelsat 9B. Hello, I'm Karen Monahan with ILS. Welcome to our live coverage of the ILS Proton launch of Eutelsat 9B. Joining me here is my colleague, Russ Pritula, Program Director for ILS. Russ, welcome back to the Broadcast Center. Thanks, Karen. As always, it's great to be here with you. This is an important launch for Eutelsat and its customers. Tell us a little bit more about Eutelsat 9B. Certainly. Today's launch of Eutelsat 9B will place into geosynchronous transfer orbit a high-capacity KU band satellite to be located at Eutelsat's 9 degrees east position. Eutelsat 9B will address high-growth digital TV markets through one pan-European footprint delivering wide coverage and four regional footprints. Eutelsat 9B falls under the Multi-Launch Agreement, or MLA, to launch several satellites over a seven-year period. Here's more on this partnership from ILS President Kurt Peischer. The Eutelsat E9B mission is, is a, a significant milestone for ILS, Greenwich Evan, and Eutelsat, as it is the first launch under the newly signed MLA agreement. And of course, we want that to be successful as it kicks off that agreement. And so it's extremely important to us. Uh, on top of that, though, it is one of those payloads which demonstrates the true international involvement in space and that the E-9B satellite is a European-built satellite. It has an ESA payload on it. Uh, it's it's uh, being launched on a Russian rocket uh, by a U.S. company. And so this market is truly international. It's a great way to demonstrate cooperation between the various international communities. The multi-launch agreements are essentially a partnership with uh, the key customers out there that, that launch frequently. And this will provide them flexibility. It provides them a short access to space. And along with that, we're providing them the means to restore confidence and trust in Proton and Krunichev and ILS. The customer community wants Proton in the marketplace. In the early 2000s, we had up to five launch service providers. And in the last few years, it's been basically two key players. Up until last year, though, that has migrated back to three which appears to be essentially the sweet spot. And the customer wants that launch diversity. They need that launch diversity, and they require that launch diversity. That is, that is the basic premise as to why the MLAs were signed, uh, to give them that assured capability to space and uh, to keep Proton in the marketplace. And a lot of that is due to the leadership of Michel DeRozan, who showed his trust and confidence in Proton and Krunichev and ILS, even when we were in a downtime, which shows that Eutelsat understands the importance of Proton in the marketplace, and they're willing to demonstrate their support. We look forward to continuing that partnership with Eutelsat under the new leadership as Michel moves on to his, uh, his new opportunities. And now we're pleased to welcome Eutelsat Chairman and CEO Michel DeRozan to today's program in a video provided by Eutelsat. Eutelsat 9B is the first of three satellites that will launch in 2016. It will be followed into space by Eutelsat 65 West A and Eutelsat 117 West B. We are in the middle of a significant expansion program, bringing new resources to all the regions we serve around the world and driving growth of video, data, and broadband services. 
a word on UTELSAT 9B. This is a high capacity KU band satellite for nine degrees east that sits at the crossroads of Europe's leading video neighborhoods. Nine degrees east already broadcasts a strong lineup of over 350 channels, of which 100 are in high definition. With UTELSAT 9B, we'll be able to accommodate well over 100 additional channels for our clients in digital, high definition, and even ultra high definition. Now, there is another special feature about this satellite. In hosting the first node of the European Data Relay System, EDRS, for ESA and Airbus Defence and Space, it demonstrates the relevance of geostationary orbit for big data networks. For UTELSAT, it is a privilege to be hosting this groundbreaking space data highway that will use lasers to send data to geo from LEO satellites, UAVs, and even the ISS. So it's another proof point of just how cool GEO is. GEO is cool. Many partners have collaborated on this sophisticated program. They include UTELSAT, ILS, Khrunichev, European Space Agency, Airbus, and of course, DLR. All of us are now focused on the launch pad. Greetings from UTELSAT in Paris to all the teams in Baikonur and in Toulouse and to all our colleagues at DLR in Germany who are also watching this launch. Go UTELSAT, go EDRS, go Proton. As Michelle DeRozan mentioned, UTELSAT 9B hosts the EDRS payload. Here's more about EDRS in a short video prepared by ESA. Earth observation satellite data has become a part of everyday life. Its applications range from aiding ship travel and supporting relief efforts to monitoring our environment. The immediacy of data obtained from satellites is what makes it so valuable. As our demand for more data at ever faster speeds increases, however, the current infrastructure is left wanting. Low Earth orbiting satellites must be in direct line of sight with their ground stations to pass on the information they've gathered while circling the Earth. The data must be stored for the rest of the time. This leaves an average of 10 minutes of downlink time for every 100 minute orbit. The European Data Relay System solves this problem by intercepting the LEO satellite's data from its position in geostationary orbit, permanently holding its position over the EDRS ground stations and remaining in contact at all times, ensuring the right information reaches the right user at the right time. We're counting down to the launch of UTELSAT 9B aboard the ILS Proton. Uh, so, Russ, what is the weather like at the launch site? The most recent weather readings I've received show that currently they are under partly cloudy skies with a predicted liftoff temperature of minus 9 degrees Celsius or 14 degrees Fahrenheit. Ground winds are out of the north at 2 to 4 meters per second, which is well within our limits. Upper level winds are within limits at all altitudes. So the weather is well within constraints, and currently we are go for launch. It's late January at the launch site, and it's pretty cold. But even in the most extreme temperatures, Proton was designed to withstand the year-round weather conditions at the Cosmodrome. Here's a little more on that. Proton is specifically designed to launch in most weather conditions, such as extreme hot or cold. In fact, Proton can launch between negative 76 and positive 140 degrees Fahrenheit. In the middle of winter, the temperatures can dip as low as negative 25 degrees Fahrenheit at night, with the lowest temperatures on record being even colder. Temperatures can also rise to as high as 125 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer, with the highest temperatures on record being much warmer. The 
Proton handles these extreme weather conditions by controlling the environments inside the payload fairing and the use of underground storable propellants. When the Proton was originally developed in the early 1960s, it was designed as large as it is to discount weather as a factor for launching a rocket. Harsh upper-level winds are really the only weather condition that could cause a delay in proton flight. And traditionally, in Baikonur, low upper-level winds are the norm. The ILS proton mission for the Eutelsat 9B satellite entails five Brizam burns and takes nine hours and 12 minutes from liftoff to injection into geosynchronous transfer orbit. Let's take a look at the Eutelsat 9B mission profile. This is the Geosynchronous Transfer Orbit, or GTO, mission flight profile for Eutelsat 9B. The Proton-M launch vehicle will utilize a five-burn Breeze-M mission design and lift off from Pad 39 at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan with the Eutelsat 9B satellite on board. The 191-foot, or 58.2-meter tall, ILS Proton is a three-stage rocket with a restartable upper stage. The Proton's first three stages propel the orbital unit consisting of the Breeze-M payload adapter system and the Eutelsat 9B satellite into a suborbital trajectory during the first 10 minutes following launch. After that, the Breeze-M takes the spacecraft through the parking, intermediate, transfer, and geotransfer orbits during the remaining nine hours of the mission. The liftoff phase begins with the ignition of the six powerful first stage engines that generate 2.4 million pounds of thrust at sea level. As the ILS Proton lifts off from its launch pad, it immediately executes a roll maneuver to align its pitch axis with the flight launch azimuth of 61.3 degrees as it travels in an east-northeast direction across Kazakhstan towards the Pacific Ocean. The first stage engines fire for about two minutes, during which time the ILS Proton experiences maximum dynamic pressure. Soon after that, the first stage separates from the second stage. As the second stage ignites, 540,000 pounds of thrust is generated for 3.5 minutes, and then stage two separates, allowing the third stage engine to fire and generate 131,000 pounds of thrust for four minutes. Soon after third stage ignition, the payload fairing, consisting of two symmetrical payload fairing halves, separates and is jettisoned from the launch vehicle. Having traveled from Baikonur to Eastern Russia at 51.5 degrees north latitude, Stage three separates from the orbital unit, which is now moving at about 7,300 meters per second, or 4.5 miles per second relative velocity in a suborbital trajectory. At this point in the mission, the Breeze-M upper stage, designed to inject payloads into a variety of orbits, takes over. The first of five Breeze-M burns in Eutelsat 9B's GTO mission occurs about 1.5 minutes after the third stage separation. The purpose of this first Breeze-M burn is to achieve a low Earth circular parking orbit of 173 kilometers and spans from Siberia to Russia's east coast. 52 minutes after the main engine cutoff of the first burn, or Miko-1, the second Breeze-M burn begins, placing the spacecraft into an elliptical orbit called the intermediate orbit. Apogee is increased to 5,000 kilometers, perigee to 270 kilometers, and inclination slightly reduced to 50.3 degrees. This nearly 18-minute burn spans from the South Atlantic 800 miles east of Rio de Janeiro to Libya. In a 19.8-minute sequence, the third Breeze-M burn is executed. The auxiliary propellant tank, or APT, is jettisoned, and the fourth Breeze-M burn is completed, resulting in the transfer orbit, a more elliptical orbit. In the transfer orbit, the apogee is greatly increased to 35,713 kilometers, more closely matching geosynchronous altitude, while perigee is slightly increased to 435 kilometers, and inclination reduced to 49.1 degrees. The third and fourth Breeze-M burns take the spacecraft from the South Pacific, 200 miles west of Chile, to 300 miles west of Morocco. The Breeze-M performs various attitude maneuvers during the coast phases between burns, allowing Eutelsat 9B and the Breeze-M to be exposed to the warming rays of the sun at pre-programmed solar illumination angles designed to meet power and thermal requirements. About five hours later, the orbital unit performs a large plane change maneuver, greatly decreasing inclination from 49.1 to 12.8 degrees during the fifth and final Breeze-M burn. Apogee is slightly decreasing to 35,696 kilometers, and perigee increases considerably to 4,444 kilometers. The fifth Breeze-M burn lasts approximately eight minutes. 
about 12 minutes after MECO 5, Eutelsat 9b is separated from the Breeze M, having reached its targeted GTO orbit near the east coast of Africa. The total mission duration is 9 hours and 12 minutes in length. The first burn of the Breeze M upper stage is scheduled for completion about 16 minutes into the flight. Our broadcast will conclude at that time since the upper stage with the Eutel Sat 9B will be in a planned blackout period when it will be out of range of the ground tracking stations for about an hour. You can stay up to date on the key mission milestones by visiting the ILS website, ILSlaunch.com, by following us on Twitter, and by liking us on Facebook. Eutelsat 9B is the 11th satellite launch aboard ILS Proton for Paris-based Eutelsat and the 21st launch aboard ILS Proton for Airbus. Here's a short video about Eutelsat 9B prepared by Eutelsat. Today's launch of Eutelsat 9B is the culmination of several years of hard work by everyone involved. So anticipation of this upcoming launch is quite high. The 705,000 kilogram or 1.5 million pound rocket with payload awaits final countdown. As we look at Eutelsat 9B on launch pad 39 in Baikonur, we are all thinking of the unbelievable amount of time and effort by ILS and its partners at Eutelsat, Airbus, Kurnichev, and their consultants and vendors. From conception to design to manufacture and to launch and finally into operation, this is a large scale operation involving a lot of precision planning and detailed execution by all involved. Mission teams are in their places in the launch bunker, control rooms, ground stations, and communication centers around the world. The most recent weather readings indicate that we are still within the wide proton, proton design envelope for launch. And so, the final go for launch polling has been completed. 42 seconds now before launch. We've got a great view of the rocket on the pad. Clear skies in the early morning in Baikonur. This is the, uh, it's resting comfortably on pad 39 before the uh, big event. Just 25 seconds left in the count. And now, I will step aside as we watch together the launch of Eutelsat 9B. Ignition. And we have liftoff of an ILS proton from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan with the Eutelsat 9B satellite on board. About 10 seconds after liftoff, the vehicle does a roll maneuver to align the launch vehicle pitch axis with the northeasterly launch azimuth. 
The vehicle will soon experience maximum dynamic pressure, or max Q, which is when the aerodynamic stresses on the vehicle in atmospheric flight are at their peak. For Proton, max Q occurs about one minute, two seconds after liftoff, at a velocity of Mach 1.6 and is sometimes accompanied by a visible condensation if atmospheric and lighting conditions are favorable. 45 seconds into the mission. Still getting a good view of the launch vehicles at heads down range. Now one minute into the flight, and so we're just now passing through the period of maximum dynamic pressure. Everything seems to be proceeding nominally as the vehicle ascends over the Cosmodrome in a northeasterly direction with a flight launch azimuth of approximately 61.3 degrees. And reports from Baikonur that it's a great view, very clear. They're really enjoying the spectacular view of this downrange event. One minute, 40 seconds into the flight. We're coming up on the first stage of separation from the second stage that is set to occur at two minutes into the flight. On clear nights, observers at the Baikonur Cosmodrome may be able to see a bit of a halo effect of light as the second stage engines ignite prior to the separation from the first stage. And you saw it there, it was a great shot at two minutes into the flight. We have confirmation of ignition of the second stage, as you saw it visually, and a good separation from the first stage. Now two minutes and 22 seconds into the flight, uh, with the launch vehicle appears as a point of light in the sky heading down range. It would appear that we have a confirmation of planned level of thrust on all four second stage engines. The second stage will operate for about 3 minutes and 27 seconds. And just, just getting official confirmation from Baikonur of the first and second stage separation, as we, saw, as we noted visually. The next key mission milestone will be separation of the third stage from the second stage at L plus 5 minutes and 27 seconds. 20 seconds after that event, the payload fairing pyros will fire separating the two halves and jettisoning them from the vehicle. Lastly, as the ILS Proton travels northeasterly downrange from Kazakhstan into Russia, our viewers will notice some brief planned time lags in our reporting of key mission milestones, as the telemetry has to be relayed from multiple ground stations. The first burn of the Brisam upper stage is scheduled for completion about 16 minutes into the flight. After that burn, we'll conclude our live coverage. Now here's a video about some of the technical advances featured in Util Sat 9B, prepared especially for this launch by ESA and Airbus. The giant Util Sat 9B is a state-of-the-art communication satellite designed to provide digital TV services for customers across Europe. But it's also fitted with the first terminal for the European Data Relay System, EDRSA, a precision telescope that will receive data via laser from satellites in lower orbits. The innovative EDRS program is a public-private partnership between ESA and Airbus Defence and Space. Part of ESA's strategy to stimulate new commercial markets, the project is managed by ESA's RTES program of advanced research in telecommunication systems. It's a kind of broadband network in space offering uh, capabilities to transmit a large amount of data from Earth observation satellites down to Earth. EDRS enables satellites in low Earth orbit to send data to satellites in higher, fixed geostationary orbits, which can then be transmitted back to Earth. This means that satellites can be in continuous contact with the ground via receivers such as this new one at Harwell in the UK. With the first launch fast approaching, EDRS is evolving into GlobeNet, a high-speed data network in space using three geostationary satellites to provide global coverage. Airbus Defence and Space, let's say, is the public-private partnership uh, partner of ESA uh, developing and co-financing the system with ESA. 
The technologies were developed uh, with the support of the German Space Agency, especially the laser communication terminal was developed in Germany and also Germany is the big supporter of the EDRS system through ESA financing. The first satellites fitted with the laser transmitters are Europe's new Sentinel satellites, which form part of the Copernicus Earth Observation System. The latest of these spacecraft, Sentinel-2, was launched in 2015, and the laser data service is due to begin later this year. From 2018, EDRS will also be used to provide an additional video and data link to the International Space Station. And this is just the start. EDRS and its successor, GlobeNet, have the potential to transform the capabilities of satellites and open up many new applications and commercial opportunities for space technology. Okay, six minutes into the flight, uh, I'm hearing from Baikonur, they've got confirmation of the s separation of the third stage from the second stage as planned, as well as we just got confirmation of payload fairing jettison. Payload fairing jettison occurs at a velocity of about 4,600 meters per second or 2.9 miles per second at an altitude of 137 kilometers. Our next major milestone happens in a few minutes. That will be the separation of the proton's third stage from the Breeze M upper stage. All proton rockets are expertly manufactured at Khrunichev in Moscow and then transported to Baikonur via rail car. Here's a brief look at some of the engineering behind the proton launch vehicle. The total height of an ILS proton is between 184 and 191 feet, around the same height as a 19-story building. Its gross liftoff weight can be around 705,000 kilograms, or 1,554,000 pounds, depending on payload and fuel weights. Proton's initial launch was on July 16, 1965, via the Proton-1 spacecraft. If we begin our in-depth look at the proton in a manner chronologically consistent with the launch phases, we see that the first stage consists of a central tank containing the oxidizer tank, surrounded by six outboard fuel tanks. Each fuel tank also carries one of the six RD-276 engines that provide first stage power. Total first stage vacuum rated level thrust is 11 meganewtons or 2,500,000 pounds of force. The second stage is a conventional cylindrical design and is powered by three RD-210 engines plus one RD-211 engine. It develops a vacuum thrust of 2.4 meganewtons or 540,000 pounds of force. The third stage is powered by one RD-213 engine and develops thrust of 583 kilonewtons or 131,000 pounds of force. It has a four-nozzle vernier engine that produces thrust of 31 kilonewtons or 7,000 pounds of force. Guidance, navigation, and control of the Proton-M during operation of the first three stages is carried out by a triple-redundant closed-loop digital avionics system mounted on the Proton's third stage. The Breeze-M upper stage is powered by one pump-fed gimbaled main engine that develops thrust of 20 kilonewtons or 4,500 pounds of force. It is composed of a central core and an auxiliary propellant tank, which is jettisoned in flight following depletion. The Breeze-M control system includes an onboard computer, a three-axis gyro-stabilized platform, and a navigation system. Finally, the payload fairing, it consists of two symmetrical payload fairing halves and a static envelope diameter up to 3.87 meters. There are multiple payload fairing designs presently qualified for flight, including standard commercial payload fairings developed specifically to meet the needs of ILS customers. The payload fairing for commercial launches on board an ILS Proton separates at the nose cone in a planned maneuver leaving the Breeze M and the spacecraft together, known as the orbital unit, to continue the journey to its planned orbit. And that is an at-a-glance look at the Proton and its stages. So as we wait for the next mission uh, update, and we'd like to thank all of our uh, partners and customers that are watching right now, particularly at Eutelsat, Airbus, and ESA. Uh, so Russ, can you uh, give us an update at this time? Well, good timing, or 
10 minutes into the flight and just got a confirmation from Baikonur of a good shutdown of the third stage. Of course, that'll be followed, uh, it was followed a few seconds later by separation from the uh, Breeze M, waiting for that confirmation, but looking good so far. Great, thank you, Russ. The Breeze M upper stage is designed for injecting large payloads into a low, medium, or high geosynchronous orbit. The main engine can be restarted eight times in flight and allows precision placement of the spacecraft into orbit. Let's learn more about Proton's technology and its role in the Eutelsat 9B mission now. The orbital unit, consisting of the spacecraft together with the adapter, separation system, and Breeze M, travels at approximately 7,300 meters per second at the moment of separation, or more than 16,000 miles per hour. The Breeze M ignites for its first burn about one and a half minutes later, and lasts about 4.5 minutes. About four minutes after the first main engine cutoff, or MECO-1, the vehicle is scheduled to go out of range of our ground tracking stations. After about 70 minutes, we will reacquire the signal prior to the second burn of the Breeze M. Just a quick update, we did get confirmation from Baikonur of a good separation of the third stage from the Breeze M upper stage, so I'd like to just reg register that confirmation. Great, thank you. The Angara family of rockets is the future of Russian space technology. From the Angara 1.2 rocket lifting lighter payloads to the Angara 5, the heavy, heavy lift launcher, Angara will address the entire range of spacecraft masses. ILS President Kirk Peischer returns to give us a quick update on Angara. ILS, along with Khrunichev, is determining how to compete in that lighter payload class while still maintaining our capability in the heavy lift market where we are highly competitive. The Angara 1.2 vehicle is a lighter class payload vehicle, and it would be launching from Plesetsk, the northern launch site, and it's well suited for the 3,000 kilogram and below satellite payload class. Eventually, the Proton vehicle will transition away, but it's a good value proposition for mass per dollar uh, into orbit, and uh, we expect the first launch to occur in the 2019-2020 timeframe. All right, Russ, can you give us any updates or confirmations at, at this time in the mission? We were 12 minutes, uh, 50 seconds into the flight, uh, still standing by for confirmation of the first start uh, Breeze M burn. So we're waiting for that. We should get that shortly. All right, thank you. All right, Russ, do you have any updates for us now? We're, 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 we're running live here. And yes, we did just get, uh, while, while we were talking there, a confirmation that we got a good a start of the first Breeze M burn. Great. At this point in the mission, the Breeze M has separated from the Proton's third stage, and we're waiting for confirmation that, that the Breeze M has started its main engine. So uh, what can you tell us about the status of the mission as it stands right now, Russ? Well, as I said, uh, we, we do have confirmation that the ignition was good at uh, still a couple minutes away from the cutoff of the first Breeze M burn, so that'll be the next milestone that we'll be able to report. Okay. The Eutelsat 9B mission team is composed of representatives from ILS, Khrunichev, Eutelsat, and Airbus. We now hear a combined greeting from the Eutelsat 9B joint mission team. I'm pleased to make this video today because I know that when you will be watching it, we will be at the end of many years of efforts by the team of Eutelsat, Airbus Defense and Space, Khrunichev, and ILS, who have been involved in the design, construction, test and preparation of Futestat 9B for launch on Proton M Breeze M. We have worked a lot to be here already in January, started last year, and a lot of work, as I said, and also a lot of luck. I'm very pleased to be in Baikonur. Uh, I'm working on the project uh, EB 9B uh, satellite since uh, 2012. I want to thank all the team who were involved in the campaign, and particularly our customer, Utilsat and the Airbus team, which has done a very, very great job, as well as all the ILS team and our contractors. Thanks also to all our Russian colleagues. They did a great work to be ready on time. The launch of the Eutelsat 9B spacecraft is the first launch in the frame of Eutelsat and Khrunichev Space Center International Partnership Program. It has been a great honor for me 
to participate in this project. In the course of this launch campaign, we met many of our old friends and made some new friends as well. I would like to thank the customer Yotelsat and uh, my team who work jointly during the, these years. And now we are in Baikonur since uh, uh, November and we are uh, launching now Yotelsat 9B uh, with uh, Proton and Brizem. Nine hours and 12 minutes after liftoff, Yotelsat 9B will be separated from the Brizem. And as usual, I have a special thought for the team of Airbus Defense and Space and Utilsat in Toulouse that will take over for the layup. It has required a lot of work to get there and there is more to come with the launch, the orbit raising, in-orbit test and of course many years of operation. On my own behalf and on behalf of my colleagues, I would like to thank all the members of this launch campaign and to wish everybody good luck. Go Proton, go Bruisem, go Utilsat 9B. The fully fueled Proton launch vehicle can weigh over 1.5 million pounds at launch and is 191 feet tall, the actual height of a 19-story building. But just how fast does it go? Well, here's a speed comparison that will help put it into perspective. Velocity is the distance per unit time that an object travels in a specified direction. We all know the ILS Proton moves at incredible speeds. That's a given. But just how fast is a proton rocket exactly? At liftoff plus 38 seconds, here's the formula for the answer. 567 miles per hour equals 253 meters per second. Using this formula, the proton closely matches the velocity of several of the world's fastest commercial jetliners at cruising speed. At liftoff plus 68 seconds, here's how fast the ILS proton is moving. Mach 2, or twice the speed of sound. At this point in the mission, the Proton matches the velocity of an F-22 Raptor with full afterburners engaged. Finally, at liftoff plus 82 seconds, the ILS Proton is traveling at Mach 3, or three times the speed of sound. At this point in the mission, the Proton matches the velocity of an SR-71 Blackbird U.S. reconnaissance jet. We'll leave you with this staggering thought about the velocity of an ILS proton rocket. At maximum velocity, the proton travels at 5.9 miles per second. At that velocity, the proton can travel from San Francisco, California on the United States West Coast to New York, New York on the United States East Coast in 7.3 minutes. We're now at the point in the mission where the Brizem upper stage has completed its first burn, and four more burns, are, a total of five, are required before spacecraft separation. So, Russ, uh, what is the current status of the Eutelsat 9B mission? Well, we did receive confirmation officially from Baikonur of the MECO-1, the completion of the first Brizem burn. Everything seems to be nominal, moving along the flight path as planned. A few minutes from now, the Brizem will enter a planned blackout period. This is when the vehicle is currently out of range of any designated Russian tracking stations, and we will not be scheduled to be back in communications again until after the second burn is completed, which is about an hour from now. So, Russ, this is a question we often get about the mission and what happens after Proton completes its job. What happens with the spacecraft? Well, after spacecraft separation, Airbus and Eutelsat will take over operation of the satellite from that point forward. The spacecraft will then execute a series of planned operations over the next several days, which include solar ray deployment, reflector deployment, and a series of apogee engine burns. These burns will bring the orbit inclination down to zero degrees and raise perigee to match the apogee, resulting in a circular geostationary orbit over the equator. Following a period of in-orbit testing, the spacecraft will settle into its operational slot of nine degrees east longitude, and begin to provide service to Eutelsat's customers. Well, this is where we conclude the live coverage of the launch of Eutelsat 9B. Please check ILSlaunch.com, the ILS Facebook and Twitter pages for regular mission updates. I'd like to thank Russ for co-hosting the launch with me today. Thank you very much, Russ. Thanks, Karen. It was great to co-host today's launch broadcast with you. And on behalf of ILS, our entire team, and our partners and customers worldwide, thank you for watching along with us. Mm -hmm.